So hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah kruger Falk. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of Global Compact Network Denmark. And we're here today to talk about how we're making gender equality a priority in the boardroom. And of course, the business case for gender equality is very clear. According to ILO, McKinsey, IFC, uh, women's representation and inclusion in all planning and decision making will lead to better ESG performance. It will lead to up to better, um, better, 40% uh, better pro productivity and uh, an increased employee retention. The role of boards is of very high importance to advance women's empowerment principles and the sustainable development goals. Boards represent top management and decide the strategic direction for a company. The benefits we already know from management become even stronger when we talk about boards because they steer the course of a company and they decide what to focus on, what has important, what management should focus on and, and what's also um, uh, how you're measuring and how you will advance in management. The UN uh, Target Gender Equality Initiative enables companies to set targets for gender equality in the same professional manner as you would approach any other corporate target, as well as a financial growth target. So this is the introduction, and now I will go into our, our two panelists today. So I'll say a big warm welcome to Roselle, Ros Roselle Gonzalez from ATB Financial in Canada. Warm well, welcome to you and to Shameka Young from Cognizant. And I'm very happy to have you both in this dialogue. Uh, and um, I will um, I'll direct the first question to you, Roselle, because uh, your organization, uh, ATP uh, Financial, has been participating in the Target Gender Equality Initiative of the UN Global Compact in Canada, fo focusing on women's representation and leadership. Can you please tell us about what you learned so far? And in a nutshell, what does your gender equality strategy look like? Thank you, Sarah. And thank you so much for having me as part of this panel today. Uh, really grateful to be representing ATB Financial at the UN Global Compact and you know, really give voice to our participation in the program this last little while. What we've learned so far is that Without intentional effort, we're not going to see the development of women into spaces that have historically excluded women. So whether that be development through the organization from professional roles into management roles, leadership roles, executive roles, uh, and beyond, without that intentional effort of measuring, putting programs in place, and making that effort to drive talent in a specific way, we're not going to see the change. In a nutshell, what our gender equality strategy looks like, and, and here I might maybe reshape the question to say, we don't have a gender equality strategy, we perhaps have a gender equity strategy to recognize that all genders, including women, um, require equitable inclusion at every level of their professional development within the workplace. And so what our strategy looks like is really paying attention to what we're measuring. Are we measuring who is coming into our organization at what rate? So are our pipelines of talent robust enough? Are we then measuring how they integrate into the ecosystem? Are they mo mobilizing through the ecosystem at a rate that is analogous to their peers and counterparts? What are the barriers to inclusion and the barriers to creating that parity of development journeys? And then are we seeing representative representation? What I mean by that is parallel representation to what is available in the labor market availability at our workplace, not just overall, but perhaps even segmented by pay grades, because we know that more often than not, women and feminized humans are overrepresented in the underpaid categories and less represented uh, in some of the perhaps leadership roles or the executive roles, the board roles and beyond. So um, strategy really does come down to putting stakes in the ground about measuring at every turn. Uh, using those measurements to make intentional policy and process decisions, and then reiterating every so often it's not a one and done, making sure that those processes continue to work 
uh, over time for the many different populations of women that we have at ATB Financial. Wow, very impressive. Thank you, Roselle. I think some of the arguments I hear in Denmark is also that um, that we don't have enough uh, women with the leadership uh, experience. So focusing on, on measuring and driving talent and measuring um, the pipeline for talent, I think is a very interesting uh, approach here because then you make sure that you have you have the talent also for a, a board position. Thank you, Roselle. I'll, I'll drive the next question to you, Jamaica, from Cognizant. Um, so tell us to familiarize, sorry, to familiarize the audience with the context of your company. Uh, please also share what the main priorities of Cognizant are when it comes to gender equality, diversity, and inclusion. Yeah, so thank you, Sarah, uh, for having us here on this panel today. And um, I know Cognizant is excited to be a part of um, this discussion with the UN Global Compact, because this is near and dear to us as we um, continue, honestly, to progress our opportunities within this space. And so Cognizant is one of the world's largest and leading uh, professional services companies with over 300,000 people. Um, we engineer modern businesses to improve everyday life. And the way that we do that with our clients is we help them modernize technology, reimagine processes, transform their customer experiences, and how they support their customers so that we can help them stay ahead of you know, the ever fast changing world that we're in today. And so you know, as part of that, all of those variations, um, we need different and diverse talent. Regarding our focus on women, we are continuing to have that strategy of expansion and growing the opportunities for women across the overall organization. Um, one of the things we immediately did was evaluate at the employee life cycle for women, for women across the, the globe in different parts of the organization. So we could assess, you know, does their career velocity align to that of the majority? How are we able to progress the underrepresented groups as part of the equity that we need for all of our individuals and all of our people um, to be able to show up in, um, and, and be authentic in their work every day? And so a few things that we've done um, really leaning into kind of equitable opportunities is we launched a, a leadership program uh, called Propel, um, you know, for our middle manager women at the senior manager associate director level to evaluate what are the opportunities to help them move forward throughout the organization. How do we take the skills and capabilities that they have today and either enhance those, um, you know, break down concerns like imposter syndrome, but how do we give them that well-rounded opportunity for mentorship, sponsorship, um, as well as career progression so that we could retain them throughout the organization and have them as part of our, our overall pipeline. Um, additionally, we launched a returnship program because we were very thoughtful of um, you know, women exiting the workforce um, when it came to very critical you know, points in their career and their life of you know, having children, getting married, you know, when, when children get ready to go to college for a lot of women, uh, particularly women in India, that's a significant amount of time um, to focus on helping their children with the boards and creating the right environment for them. And so we've been very thoughtful in launching a returnship program where we can upskill and reskill individuals that have been out of the workforce for two to five years. They can jump into that chance to elevate themselves and refresh move from a paid contractor position to a full-time hire position. Um, and so we've taken that opportunity to look across, you know, where there are gaps either in society and the workforce to drive toward more equitable um, opportunities for women uh, overall. Wow, this sounds very, very interesting. And I get a little bit curious that you target also various uh, areas of the world because you, you acknowledge different challenges you say you have a particular program in India, for example. Is that how you approach it? That, that you that you also have some some context specific mentoring and help for for, for women. 
Yeah, absolutely, Sarah, because, you know, while we have a global diversity strategy, we know that it has to be enacted at a local level. And so if we don't leverage that local context, then it really is just checking the box. And we are not in the business of wanting to check the box. We want to make sure that we have relevant programming for the groups that we are supporting. And so um, we get together as you know a global leadership team. I have an India DNI leader um, who helps us shape the strategy for the large population of women in India, which are extremely important to our business. Yeah, very very interesting. Thank you. So I'll go back to you, Roselle, because um, ATB Financial has already uh, achieved gen a gender balanced board. Congratulations, that's really something. Could you please outline the steps that you and your, um, along your journey towards gender balance? Great question. And not only do we have a gender balance board, but the head of our board is a woman as well. Um, and so, you know, I think that that offers us such a unique opportunity to continue to ask the important questions, to ask the tough questions of how did we get here? Was it by accident? Was it by intentional activation? And then what are the things that we need to put in place in order to maintain this kind of representation? Because we know that a gender balanced board is going to drive for better results, see different perspectives, have the opportunity to problem solve at the board level in a way that unidimensional boards might not always have um, access to. So, you know, one of the things that I know our board is always curious about is to continue to ask the question of what perspectives are missing here? You know, we never want for our board table to be um, a tokenized table or a, you know, United Colors of Benetton table. The women on that board are not there to speak for the women. They're there because they are exceptional at what they do and they bring perspective and, and, and unique skills. But being able to ask what perspectives are missing here starts to create the, you know, environment necessary for intersectional voices to be present at that board table. And so we then are committed to opening the lens of inclusion beyond gender so that we have gender parity. And now we want to start asking the question of, okay, are we also creating opportunities for perspectives from racialized communities, from indigenous communities? These are priorities within our landscape here in Canada, as well as you know, in the province of Alberta, where we are located, that are important and meaningful for us to consider. So are we considering the voices of racialized women, indigenous women, uh, women from the LGBTIQ2S plus communities, women from uh, disabilities communities? These are voices that are more often than not experiencing um, a, a lack of volume at the board level. And so while we have achieved gender parity, I think that there is an intentional motivation to continue asking that question, to continue widening the scope of how we can include more perspectives at that level. Thank you, Roselle. Very, very interesting uh, reflections. And in Denmark, uh, we had uh, we were um, celebrating uh, the International Women's Day a, a few a few uh, weeks ago, uh, a week ago, and then. Um, on social media, we got a lot of pushback from men. And I also think that's very interesting in this uh, relation because we need to find out how we can embrace everyone. And as, as you say, it's not about excluding certain groups. It's about broadening our perspective and making room for everyone and for the diversity that we really want in a board. So Shemega, what did um, you take into consideration when setting a target for board diversity? How did you um, determine what's ambitious, ambitious yet also realistic? Um, and how did you develop a board uh, transition plan to make a more diverse and in inclusive board? 
Yeah, and that's a great question. I also just want to lean into a little bit of what you said, um, Sarah, about making room. And so, you know, as we partner with leaders across our organization, we always, it's always an additive, right? We're not replacing, we are making room for, for everyone so that we can show up and have the greatest diversity of thought and greatest innovation. Um, and so when we look at you know, the changes that Cognizant has made across its board in the last few years, you know, in, t in 2019, we had one female board director, um, you know, today we have four. Um, and so we went to, you know, 36% gender diversity and 45% overall diversity um, because our board took a step back and said, we need to change a bit of our, our process here. And so, um, you know, our current board, they aim to have um, a set of diverse you know, um, directors. And so that is a critical component of how they evaluate themselves in their annual self-evaluation process um, and how they look at their diversity efforts. But again, as I, I mentioned, you also have to have that accountability to say, are we evaluating that progress? You know, is that change happening on an ongoing basis? If it's not, let's revamp it and rethink it. Um, you know, to, to move it forward because we have to, we, we have to make the change and it has to be intentional. Um, it will not happen um, by coincidence or hope, right? We all know that hope is not a strategy. Uh, and so being very intentional in that strategy has been very helpful for us. And I think I'm going to continue on, on this note on making room because uh, to be practical, to go back to you, Roselle, how do we actually convince those that are already in power uh, that a, a more diverse board is possible, beneficial and leg legitimate? And, and how do you respond to resistance? Because we we in Denmark get a lot of resistance also on social media, but also inside organizations. There's a lot of re male resistance because why should we t choose a woman when um, we have a male candidate that's really, really good? So what's, what's the, what are the arguments? <laughs> oh, goodness, Sarah, if that's not sort of the million dollar ticket there. Um, here's, here's sort of my um, strategic way in, in creating that movement and creating that opportunity to, to convince. I, I, I try to stay away from convincing anybody because I really want for people to recognize the why behind the strategic imperative um, that is grounded in their own reasoning, right? So whether that's business, whether that's a return on investment, whether that's creating diversity of innovation and creativity and uh, diversity of thought, all of those things. One thing that I've found really powerful in my work in inclusion over the last decade is to recognize that, you know, about 10% of your people are going to be in. They're ready for it. They're championing it. They're really excited to get on board for creating diversity of representation. You're going to have sort of that middle 80% who they want to be on board. They believe in the philosophical underpinnings of it. They're not really sure how. They don't know how to get started. They don't know how to, to, to get involved. So they, they require a little bit of direction. And you're going to have your 10% who are just, you know, not bought in. I'm not ready for this. This doesn't feel like it's, uh, you know, to use your word, beneficial or legitimate. And my professional endeavor has always utilize the championing force of the first 10% to create propulsion, create, you know, drive, to be able to harness that 80% along. So show them what is possible. Show them what can happen when you've got a diverse board. Show them what can happen when you've got diverse ways of thinking, inclusive ways of leading, all of these things. And what my observation has been is that culture shifts over time. That 10% that's at the end, that lagging 10%, inevitably sort of moves along with the cultural zeitgeist or recognizes that perhaps this organization is moving in a direction that is incongruent from my own values. And that is okay as well. It's okay to recognize that organizational values might not always uh, reflect our own. What I also want to say is that one of the biggest sort of resistances that I experience is, well, we need to hire for the best candidate. So are we not watering down excellence if we are driving for representational diversity? 
And my response to that is a question about why we assume that excellence in performance is mutually exclusive from diversity of lived experience or diversity of thought. Those two things are not mutually exclusive to one another. Research and data continues to show that people who experience marginalization continue to drive performance, continue to have higher and higher performance metrics because the barriers they experience to that excellence have kind of sharpened their edge, sharpened their skill quite a bit. So one of the barriers is more of a mental one of recognizing that excellence and diversity are not separate conversations. Yes, we are asking for excellence and we're asking that of every single candidate. But let's open our eyes to recognizing that our candidates are going to look, sound, feel differently. And that's going to require us to unpack some of those biases that have gone unmitigated, which have perhaps allowed us to create a status quo of belief that excellence only looks and sounds and behaves one way. Very interesting reflections also to broaden the cake. And, and um, I'm, I'm going to ask a similar question to you, Shameka, because something that we often receive a question is how do we make sure we still get the best person eh? and that we don't appoint a woman just because she's a woman? Mm -hmm. And uh, what are the practical steps that we can take to reduce bias in the recruitment process and expand the pool of candidates, uh, as you also mentioned, uh, Roselle? Yeah, and I, you know, I was glad when when Roselle brought that up, right? Because I do think that um, it it is that natural thing sometimes for people to say, well, the best candidate, you know, and it's not a mutually exclusive situation. And so, you know, often when I've heard people say that, then I will just quickly ask them, well, you know, why do we assume that the male is the best candidate? It's it's like hiring for a job and only hiring one candidate, only having one candidate as part of the process, would anyone ever really do that, right? We, we wouldn't because we want to know what our options are. And so when we take a step back and kind of look at those practical things, I think, um, you know, having the refreshment of the, you know, what is what does your recruiting process look like? Are you starting with the tools that allow you to look at resumes, you know, in a blind fashion, right? Because what we know to be true is that implicit bias exists for men as well as for women. It exists for everyone, um, you know, non-binary individuals as well, right? It exists for us all because of, of just your upbringing. And so when we think about the implicit bias of things, some of the data has shown us that if you take the exact same resume and you put Jane on the top and John on the top, you know, 70 plus percent of people, males as well as females, will select John. Well, that is implicit bias of how society has, you know, groomed us to have that, that kind of thinking. And so we do need to have more of that diverse candidate slate across the board to ensure that we're giving ourselves the best opportunity and the best talent um, so that we can look for those, you know, diversity of thought and lived experience um, opportunities. You know, that has been a major component of, of what we've been able to influence within Cognizant across our diverse candidate pipeline, but also having the accountability of our leadership involved um, to say, you know, executive committee team, as we look across our vice president and above roles, you know, can you help us engage, look at the pipeline progress? Are we also showing up to have diverse interviewers because candidly as a diverse individual if I interview with 15 people and no one is a woman or you know even an ethnic minority I'm gonna be a little bit worried about am I the one and only and we know one and only's have a challenge in any organization um, and so as we think about that process, it has to be very thoughtful from the upfront um, recruiting evaluation of, you know, what's on paper, how does that show up? And are we, you know, putting a little bit of our blinders on, you know, for those things and leveraging technology in many cases to help us look at the resumes in a blind fashion, all the way through the consideration of, have we trained our hiring managers effectively to pull out that unconscious bias? And so we, we you know, are very thoughtful in evaluating the whole process in order to drive change, but also having the metrics that we can measure to be accountable for. The recruitment and the unconscious bias is so important. 
we were I was also in a discussion uh, recently where one mentioned make look at the recruiting companies the ones that assist the the, the, the businesses now you you have it insourced but but many companies also outsource it and if the recruiters are not focusing on this and if if they're totally gender biased the candidates that they bring on are just very the same so um, that's also exactly and if they don't have the metrics right to help them and encourage them to you know bring those diverse candidates absolutely now i have a question for both of you uh, and i think i'll let roselle start and then you can tap in uh, shamina uh, shamika uh, both your companies are part of sectors that traditionally have been very male dominated based on your experience how do you attract diverse candidates including to the boards of male dominated industries uh, where there are very few men, uh, women at the level expected to be selected for a board membership. You were talking about the pipeline earlier. Now, you're, we're, if we don't yet have this pool of, of, of well-qualified women, how, how, do we, how do we approach? Great, great question there. You know, um, what I will say for us at ATB, I love um, that we do not only look for industry expertise, we look for cross applicability of expertise, skills, um, and, and experiences that candidates have had that allow them to transition into a role at ATB with some, some degree of success. We want our people to be successful. And that is coupled with recognizing that we may have to offer our people opportunities to upskill. Are there role-specific skills that a person might require? But they have demonstrated the competencies to skill up previously. So if they are a person who takes good coaching, who understands how to learn, who is willing to put in the hard work to learn a new skill, that is an easily coachable person to put into a role, to give them the skills that are necessary within the enterprise, and then to ensure that their success and their development within the organization. Yes, the financial sector is a fairly dom male dominated space, but also recognizing that a smaller institution like ATB Financial can be a little bit bolder, can go out and ask for, um, you know, equitable skill sets or equitable experiences, and then take a little bit of a chance on upskilling those individuals once they get into the organization. It also requires intentionality about building those talent pipelines long before people apply to the jobs at your organization. So it means that we develop partnerships and community collaborative conversations with post-secondary institutions, with firms that are, you know, talent placement organizations, so that the ramp towards employment at the organization is longer. And so that people who might not have traditionally considered a financial institution start to recognize that, oh, okay, my voice, my experience, my capabilities might be appreciated at this institution. I'm gonna I'm gonna work towards applying there. Very, very interesting, this cultivating the pipeline. Um, and and at Cognizant, how are you how are you approaching this uh, male dominated uh, uh, industries where you've, you you don't expect women to be yeah, kind of the prime, the primary, right? And so I, you know, I tell you from a board standpoint, um, you know, we do not uh, look for solely our industry for the board. And so um, periodically, our board reviews its composition, and so we look to recruit um, and add additional team members that have, you know, a variety of skills and characteristics that we need to, to you know, engage and and. Um, uh, be able to realize our overall business and strategy. And so, you know, as an example, you know, we look at, um, you know, factors such as, you know, do the individuals have public company governance experience or public company leadership experience, um, you know, financial accounting risk management, do they have operations management, uh, do they have talent management experience? Um, and so we look across a broad array of skills and capabilities because we do want that diversity of thought. Um, and we know that if we have just one range of thinking and only one core set of, of capabilities, then you minimize um, the opportunity that you could, you know, expand and innovate and, and you know, be more creative in. So just as we have our 
um, you know, our um, executive kind of uh, recruiting firms that are looking for the board and always looking, you know, to have talented individuals in the pipeline. We do that same thing at our management levels, being very thoughtful of the different skill sets that are really required to make up a management um, team as well. So getting a woman in the boardroom is the first step. What actions have you taken or have you witnessed um, that have helped ensure that women are really heard and respected in the board? Um, you know, I can tell you we have a very active, um, you know, set of, uh, you know, women board um, directors. Uh, they are phenomenal. And our, our board leadership supports our organization overall as we really focus on driving behaviors that, are inclusive and create those environments of belonging. So that's from, you know, board on down. You know, our female board leaders are extremely active um, as well as our male board board leaders when we engage them in uh, employee research, uh, resource groups, um, discussions around allyship or supporting our women's empowerment affinity group. So I think there's so much opportunity to drive the right behaviors from the top uh, you know, on down. But again, it goes back to that intentional aspect of making sure that people have an opportunity to show up, um, to be heard, you know, to, you know, consistently um, be pulled into the conversation if you see that someone is having that reticence. And so that is, you know, all of our leaders' responsibility to ensure that we're getting the best insights uh, from everyone, you know, board on down. Thanks. I'm going to be a little time conscious now. Uh, so a question to you, Rizal, how are you engaging your board members on topics related to social uh, uh, sustainability and which role do they play in implementing your gender equality action plan? Great question. You know, ATB just actually um, introduced its ESG strategy and uh, we have a brand new sort of pillar um, of cor corporate social responsibility and environmental and sustainable governance. Um, and our board was one of the primary champions of moving in the direction of being a corporation that is invested in um, the greater good. We are a purpose-driven organization that you know, utilizes financial uh, industry standards and financial acumen to really uplift the betterment of the communities that we serve. And this was a drive that was made directly from our board. Um, because I believe that there is an understanding that an organization that is deeply invested in the environmental social governance work of an organization and the community is going to inevitably drive bigger on business results. We know that, the research has shown that. Um, corporate responsibility is an important way in which corporations can continue to be um, not just for profit, but also for greater purpose and greater good. And so, you know, on our board, I think that they're, that is what one of their fundamental drivers has been. Um, and they certainly continue to, you know, be the sharp razor's edge on playing that important role at the board level in enacting the gender equity strategy in maintaining their commitment to our clients, our stakeholders, and ensuring that good governance requires good representation as well. Thank you, Roselle. Um, Shamika, how are you encouraging also male uh, board members to become advocates for gender equality? Yeah, you know, fortunately, I can say, you know, we don't even have to encourage them. They just do it, right? They know that it's important. Um, you know, our ESG agenda is extremely important to drive equitability um, and, and social awareness. And so they do it. They are 100% supportive of it. Our executive committee is as well. Um, and, you know, that we're extremely grateful for. So we have the right leadership, the right board that's always willing to step in, have the conversation and see how they can help to actually drive toward um, better solutions and opportunities for us. You, you've joined the business with good organizational values, you could say. Yes. Okay, so exactly. this is a final question for both of you. Um, what advice can you offer women that are seeking board positions? Roselle, will you start? You know, I, I don't have to offer this advice to women because I feel like women know this, but be bold. 
ask for what it is you want, ask for what it is you, you know, need. Um, if there are gaps in your skills for board work, you know, ask for mentorship advice on what is it that I can do to shore up these skills. One of the most powerful ways in which we can advocate for ourselves and for one another is to, you know, be able to articulate what our cross capabilities are. These are the skills that I'm coming in with that will amplify the board work that is being done. These are the areas in which I need to grow and I would really benefit from learning on the job. Um, there are loads of our organizations uh, here in Canada and beyond that really work with women to get them on board seats. So whether that, you know, volunteer boards to start with, committees on bigger boards that you can offer your skills and expertise to, widen your network, uh, and continue to invite yourself to tables that you have not previously been invited to. Pull up that chair, there is room. Wow. And Shemreka, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Roselle said it very well. I mean, do your homework, know your self-assessment, know your worth, right? Um, you know, don't underestimate yourself. Leverage your network, critically important. Um, everyone has access to such a broad network and just, you know, ask. Um, and, and probably lastly, just get active, right? Whether it is an industry association where you can build more of that network and have access to the opportunities or whether it's a nonprofit board, um, there is an opportunity to do all three of those things. So, you know, know yourself, know your worth and, and go after it. Thank you so much to both of you. It has been so interesting and inspiring to hear. Um, I'll just summarize some of the takeaways. Um, make room, don't wait for it to happen. You have to make it and it has to be intentional if you want um, uh, gender equality to be a priority. Use champions to convince the majority uh, if you have anyone working against. Um, and then also focus on organizational values, make a statement, make it very clear where you want to head as an organization. And then also this um, about excellence and diversity is not contrary. It's, it's, it's not two different things. Uh, they're not opposites. Um, also focus on recruitment and recruit, recruiters uh, internally and externally and, and pull out all the unconscious bias, make it more conscious, try to make some, some decisions and also focus on, on you know, um, Making, making all the, the applications uh, gender neutral or uh, taking out some of the, 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 the biases that you might have. And then also cultivate your pipeline, uh, make some, some talent acquisition, you said, Roselle, you know, it's not, um, you have to, to cultivate it yourself. So, um, and then be bold if you wanna join a board. Uh, I think that's also a very, uh, very strong advice to anyone having dreams of that. Thank you so much to both of you. It has been a very big pleasure for me to hear your wise insights. Thank you.